to another edition of the Holden Village Podcast. Here we are in week three of the summer program, and I am with the wonderful Olsons, the dynamic brother-sister duo. <laughs> How would you like to introduce both of yourselves? I am Sarah Olson Smith. I use she, her pronouns. From Davenport, Iowa. I am a pastor there, and I find joy. I have two children, and we find a lot of joy being outside, lots of joy in our garden, and zinnias that are coming, peonies, and I'm excited to be here with you. I am Brent Olson. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I live in Salt Lake City, teach at a little college there, or I guess university now. We've just named Westminster University. I often call myself primarily a cyclist and a fosterer of border collies. Beautiful. So what is the topic that both of you are teaching the villagers this week? Our goal, our aim is to engage with people in a conversation really about how to live in a broken world. So we've sort of titled our sessions as a setup for a joke that we don't yet know the punchline for. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the joke is that an anarchist and a pastor walk into the forest. And what happens there? The punchline of that joke is we are working with people here this week to figure out. And as we do that, we're putting side by side biblical stories and stories that grow out of anarchic movements to see how those conversations dialogue with each other and then how we enter them and how they shape our thinking and our imagining in new kinds of ways. So our hope really is to ask some good questions and to imagine differently and to let that imagination shape how we practice and live our lives, especially in the light of this broken world and climate crisis and all the other ways we experience mm -hmm. devastation, but also great hope in the midst of all that. Absolutely. The um, previous faculty that was here last week, her name was Laura. Her term for all of her sessions began with, you know, we're in this spiral of doom. And like, <laughs> what do we do like from there? And so, you know, we played around with that a lot. And a question I actually, I asked her, um, it kind of turned into this funny segment was, how much of us being on the precipice would actually allow us to transcend? And so how much of this is purposeful or not? What are your thoughts on that? I would say conflicted in a couple of ways. One, there's in social movement theory, I'm an academic at heart, and so sometimes I slide into those worlds. There's a crisis theory, right? That like sure. change doesn't happen until things get so bad that you have to like, you've got to fully undo and like reset and blah, blah, blah. In the context of climate change, in the context of racism and oppression, in the context of wealth inequalities, in the context of species lost, that is not actually a very promising mode. Like, I don't want to lose all of the hummingbirds before we change. And so I think my the only way I can move through this space individually and, and maintain an ability to get out of bed in the morning is to believe and live into a world in which we act before we get to crisis. Engage and build and create new things out of the old things and brand new things simply because they're good not because we're so bad we absolutely have to create them at the moment. Like the fact is, for example, urban parks downtown that don't have cars in them are amazing. They're really awesome. We don't need to have a downtown parking crisis in order to have an urban park. Like we can just go <laughs> ahead and build those things. It's okay, right? Why wait to the crisis? There are good things that we can do today. What if we did those things? And so part of my hope this week is to like actually recognize and name some of the ways that's already happening in the world, that people are creating really new things even before we get to crisis, mm -hmm. while also recognizing that we're also already in crisis. We don't need to wait till we lose all the hummingbirds, we're losing hummingbirds. Like that should be enough. Yeah. We don't need to hit the bottom before we can start to make change. Mm -hmm. I think, especially within Christian traditions or other kind of places of privilege, we pretend that crisis isn't real. Like we have the privilege to deny the reality of the precipice we're in and in particular different kinds of privilege in different sorts of ways keep on living in as though it's not real and I think part of what we hope to do as well is to linger in those places of challenge of conflict of possibility of hurt of despair of suffering in order to respond in ways of hope and to open up our eyes in some ways and then open our eyes to some possibilities as well. 
Yeah, I, I grapple with that question a lot, just from observing the periods of my own life where crises has led to periods of learning, but also try not to be a masochist. And for me, that's why you know laughter and, and humor is a beautiful way to create harmony. I often spend a lot of time teaching and my partner partner's research is sort of built right now on thinking about play and fun mm. as fundamentally revolutionary. And so her research at the moment is working with a cycling organization in Palestine and thinking about fun and moving through that space as an act of cultural identity and resistance mm. to oppression. And so like that act of fun is itself a, a revolutionary act. So this kind of goes into this summer theme that we have. Yeah. Eden is calling. Yeah. I'm curious, what does that mean to, to both of you? It's been a fun theme to think about. We spent yesterday, our first day of, in our study together, looking at the Genesis 2 story, inviting to think about the ways that we are invited into deep community and deep kinship not only with other human beings, but with non-human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I, that Eden story is this place, this vision of a place of, of deep interconnectivity of humans made from the earth, all of us made from the same place. And then because of the shared rootedness, groundedness, how then do we live and work and play and take responsibility for each other? So we've been having some fun conversation mm -hmm. about it and, and what does that mean in terms of our responsibility for and with each other? And uh, that's been a real joy in some of our conversations, but it also invites us to imagine new futures for how we can be and uh, think about how Eden is present in those urban parks or, <laughs> you know, at, at, not as an escapist, but as a deep commitment to the places we are and find ourselves. Yeah, and for me, the sort of Eden calling theme, I mean, all of the plays on words, right? All the potential puns and meanings of it, but like a both a wake up and a networked connection. Mm -hmm. And in my thinking, we've done a really expansive job of thinking about how human relationships work and function and think. As Western cultures, less great jobs of thinking about how those emotional relationships are mutual in the non-human world. And when we do, we also tend to make that non-human world sort of exclusively non-human. Mm -hmm. So for me, thinking about Eden Calling is very much a both and. Mm. Right, it's not just like, we're just gonna focus on the natural world now, or we're just gonna focus on human injustices now. But really, all of these things layer in ways that are, once you see them, undeniable, and also critically important. Is the border collie world part of your entrance into the non-human realm? <laughs> I read somewhere that wolves domesticated us, dogs mm. domesticated us as much as we've domesticated dogs. Mm. Like we've become attuned to read their responses so that they can get exactly what they want out of us as much as we, <laughs> we get out of them. Mm -hmm. Working with dogs in trauma, working dogs in crisis is a sort of really wild mode of interspecies communication that is obvious and clear and much more direct than say the interspecies communication one might have with a grub, right? Like, mm. I don't know how to read a grub emotionally. Mm. I know how to read a dog emotionally. Working with dogs becomes an avenue to think outside of myself in a cool way. That's great. That made me think of like this rendition of Plato's cave where yeah. the wolf is doing the puppet mastering. Like. <laughs> <laughs> There's another book that actually sort of has said that our lawns have made subjects of us in the United States. Mm. Oh, like sure. we are subjected to our lawns in powerful ways, which is another wild <laughs> way. To think about it. It's a great lesson in humility. <laughs> <laughs> A fascinating Eden story, right? Yeah. Like if the lawn is that if, right. if Eden is domesticated us <laughs> more than us domesticating right. Eden. Oh that, that's a whole new flip. Oh gosh. <sighs> that tickles me <laughs> immensely. <laughs> We have now moved from the art gallery to the porch of Narnia, <laughs> and there are flowers in front of us, and beautiful weather, actually. It yeah. is. Creek, creek in the background. Creek in the background, so this is better, anyway, in That's general. Right. Roll right. with it. <laughs> is this both of your first time at Holden? I've experienced most of the roles at Holden, and now have sort of been to Holden in all of the major phases of my life. I was here as a young child, 
I was here for a year and a half as a young adult. I was here, I guess, a year and a half ago in a sort of professional capacity with my job and brought some students up for a week. Now I'm here on the faculty. So I've, I've been a guest, I've been a short-term volunteer, I've been a long-term volunteer. Mm. So now I have this new experience too. So I keep coming back to the same place, but in kind of radically different personal positions in that process. That's great. And we were here together as children. We were here then in the summer and then the year and a half Brent was here. I was in college and so I spent a J term volunteering, just a short term volunteer. Mm. And then now here, both on faculty but also with my kids. So it's fun to be here both as learning and teaching together and with our kids here. It's been a total treat. One of the things that's been most exciting for me coming up here this time, just to say it sort of out loud and publicly, is that I haven't had really had a chance to collaborate in these kinds of ways mm. with Sarah. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really fun this week and leading into this week to have a chance to think through and talk through these ideas and talk through these processes with someone who I know well, right, and mm. spent a lot of time with, but not in this capacity. Like it's been a real joy to yeah. Um, to play like in that in this new sense has been mm -hmm. awesome and it's been similarly for me too and, and I think it maybe maybe that's the way this place can be for lots of people is that the gift of learning together and alongside and with others who they might know well or might not know well and what happens in those conversations and it's been fun for me to be with Bren as we put conversations together and I've always loved Bren's energy and joy and understanding and intentionality in terms of how he teaches and the stuff he teaches. And I hear about them secondhand, but it's fun to be in a classroom together and to watch it lived out and then to see the ways that our own energies together can play. We come from really different groundings and so to see how they align and where they conflict and bounce off against each other has just been really a, a total treat. It's been really awesome. It's absolutely been inspiring just thinking of like brother sister like yeah. collaborations. Like yeah. I, I think of my sister as well. Yeah. We we have a lot of similar paradigms and I yeah. I would love to do something with her. We were laughing that usually when brothers and sisters walk into the forest you know, they're playing Gretel, you know, like all these old stories is like, they get, you know, <laughs> they make their way and, you know, which bakes them into a cake or whatever it might be. You know, there's trouble happens, but I guess trouble is happening trouble. in the best kind of way, you know. Absolutely. In the best kind of way. As a closing, what are your hopes for, for the world? or the work that you do. And the biggest kind of way is my hope for the, the world is like deep thriving and flourishing and in authentic and beautiful ways, mm. both human and non-human. And I guess in my own smaller ways, my hope is, I think about my hope for the church and I can speak in my own context as a Lutheran Christian, that there's a, a kind of deeper commitment to our connectedness with the non-human world, with each other a deeper sense of responsibility, commitment to practices that are new and creative and playful and outside of the old. And as the more I have conversations with Brent too, ways of new thinking and partnerships and letting go of some of the kind of old ways that are inhibiting us from really being the church that we can be and ought to be in the world and with the world. So. Raymond Williams has written that we need new ideas because we need better relationships. And so if what I can do is help people ask questions and develop ideas in order to foster new and better relationships with each other and with the world around them, then that's really all mm. I can do. Flowers. Hope. Tomorrow. Will. Become. Today's. Adventure. Yes, 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 yes. That's actually, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're making poetry out of here. <laughs> nice.